Hi guys, Olive here, here today to review two books on seabirds. The first book I would like to talk about in this video is called The Seabird's Cry, The Lives and Loves of the Planet's Great Ocean Voyagers by Adam Nicholson. This book was first published in the UK back in 2017, but it was published here in the US in 2018 by Henry Holt, which is a division of Macmillan. And my hardcover copy that I purchased with my own money comes in at 416 pages. Adam Nicholson is a pretty prolific English author and he comes from a long line of writers and gardeners, actually. I thought that was kind of interesting because he does focus on a wide variety of topics in his books, but I've noticed that he tends to focus on history and also the natural world, which would make sense if he has a long line of gardeners in his family history. This book is one of his more recent books. He has published some other books since this book came out, but this one is all about the lives of seabirds, about a number of different seabirds. It's a glimpse into what their lives are like. It's a little window into what we currently know about them. And it's also a larger discussion about how we as humans have connected with these birds over the centuries. And this book actually won the 2018 Wainwright Prize for Nature Writing. In this book, Nicholson chooses to focus on 10 individual birds or groups of birds. So there's the fulmar, the puffin, the kittiwake, the gull, the guillemot, the cormorant, and shag, the shearwater, the gannet, the extinct great auk, and its cousin, the Razorbill, and the Albatross. I would consider this book to be a natural history book. I definitely think it's correctly classified as nature writing, but I should note that it's not really his goal in each one of those chapters to tell you everything there is to know about the bird or birds in question. It's kind of obvious when you read each one of those chapters that this is a person who writes about a number of different things because there's so much going on in each individual chapter. He'll include science about the bird in question. He'll talk about research that's currently being done or has previously been done and what we've learned from that research, what we know about the lives of these birds. He will sometimes talk about his own personal experiences with these birds, but much more frequently he's talking about the human history with that bird, whether or not we've killed it for food or for sports, if that bird has any kind of cultural significance. So really it's just a blend of all different things coming together in one chapter. Each chapter in this book is its own distinct completed thing. They all have a different blend of all of those elements. Each one of them works totally fine. It's not like any Thing felt like it didn't belong there, but it is kind of like an essay collection in that way, where each different chapter, you're diving into something completely new. So just for example, in the Puffin chapter, he talks about how and why their beak, their bill turns orange during the mating season. But then he also talks about how each individual puffin, when the breeding season is over, they decide to follow their own unique path out into the ocean. They go to different places and they most frequently will go where they went last year if there was food there. So they're individuals and they remember where they like to spend time, which is fascinating to me. And then in the Kitty Wake chapter, he talks about everything from how we used to use birds as fashion accessories in previous eras, and then also how scientists discovered that kittiwake chicks have developed a very unique and very important fear of falling off of cliffs because of where kittiwakes nest. Not all chicks have that fear of falling, but kittiwake chicks do. And it's amazing that they developed that. And then finally, when he's talking about gannets in their chapter, because gannets are so aggressive and he's talking about the aggression in their colonies, he also talks about a completely different bird in the Galapagos that has this cycle of abuse built into its colonies. This whole book is really a consideration of what these birds really are and what their lives must be like and what the history of our interactions with them have been over the years in positive or negative ways, whichever way it actually was. Each chapter is its own little window into the lives of these birds based just on what we know right now. There is so much left to learn, which he fully acknowledges. Even though every single chapter is relatively brief because there are so many birds discussed in this book, every single one of them was 
so illuminating. You can definitely tell when you read this book that it was written by a very practiced hand. Nicholson's writing is confident, it's composed. You can tell that he knows what he wanted to say and he just went ahead and said it. But in my opinion, he never crosses the line into arrogance. It's actually quite the opposite. I think he shows so much humility and honestly wonder when he talks about these birds. He never loses sight of the fact that he is an observer and that as much as he loves these birds, he respects them, he tries to understand, he knows he never fully will. He's also very sympathetic and kind toward the birds in this book. And this is the moment where I need to make a quick side note just on a personal level because this is my review here on my channel. I can do those kinds of things. But I really appreciated that he took a moment in the introduction to acknowledge that a lot of what we know about birds just in general right now comes from the fact that there were truly awful experiments done on them in the past. He acknowledges that those were torturous, while also acknowledging that he's a benefactor of the knowledge gleaned from those experiments. I think we can all accept that we know more now about birds because those experiments were done, but we can at least call them what they are, which is torture. But anyway, let me just say that I really, really enjoyed this book. I learned so much from reading this book. I learned so much about each individual bird, some of which I had not even heard the names of before. I love birds, but I'm not quite on that level. Maybe someday I will be. But I was introduced to so many new bird species by picking this book up. I know a lot of the information in here is going to stay with me for a very long time. I'm still turning over a lot of the things that he discussed in this book in my head. The only small complaint I have about this book, the only reason why this was a four star read instead of a five star read is based on something I said before, where every single chapter felt like its own distinct thing. And in that way, I found the whole book kind of meandering, not within the chapters. I thought each one of them was so composed and thought through, but there wasn't really a through line. There wasn't really like a common point that he was trying to make with each individual chapter. It was just kind of, okay, here's this chapter, then here's this chapter, here's this chapter. I didn't really know what the common message, like what do you want me to understand once I have closed the back cover of the book? I think if I had gone into this book knowing that it read more like an essay collection though, that it wouldn't have bothered me as much because I was expecting there ultimately to be a grander point that he was trying to make and it never came. But if I wouldn't have had that expectation, then I don't think it would have knocked it down a star for me. So now that I'm telling you that, maybe that will help you have the right expectations for this book and maybe that won't bother you in the way it bothered me. But now onto the second book that I'm going to be discussing in this video that actually ended up being the perfect companion for The Seabird's Cry, partially because they do cover similar grounds, but also because strangely, this author took an entirely different approach and that really worked as I was reading both books at the same time. But that book is called Shearwater, A Bird and Ocean and a Long Way Home by Roger Morgan Grenville. This book was published in 2021 by Icon Books and my hardcover copy that I received from the publisher for reviewing purposes comes in at 305 pages. Roger Morgan Grenville is a a former soldier. He's also the author of several different books. And this newest book of his is actually his second nature writing book to come out in the more recent past. Just last year, he released a different book with Icon Books called Liquid Gold, which was all about his experiences with beekeeping. It was highly entertaining. Icon Books also sent me that one. Very grateful. I loved it. So when they reached out to me and said that he had another book coming out this year, and this one was about birds, I definitely wanted to read it. This book covers a bird that's discussed in the seabird's cry. It's a type of shearwater called the Manx shearwater. And that's one of the reasons why I said that this new book by Roger Morgan Grenville made such a good companion book to read at the same time as I was reading The Seabird's Cry. I was reading them at the exact same time because The Seabird's Cry talks about a number of different birds, including the shearwater. 
And this new book, Shearwater, talks about just the shearwater. Roger Morgan Grenville used the seabird's cry as one of his many sources that he consulted for writing that book. So they do cover some common ground. It's not so much where you feel like you're reading the same thing over and over again, but it is really cool to see that crossover. Reading Shearwater at the same time I was reading The Seabird's Cry was kind of like taking a magnifying glass to one of the chapters, zooming in on one bird and getting a whole book out of it. It almost felt like I pulled this book, Shearwater, out from The Seabird's Cry and then opened it up and started reading. It was really cool. But also, I think these two made such great partners for one another while I was reading because their tones could not be more different. Like I said before, Adam Nicholson is very confident, poised, composed, professional, and Roger Morgan Grenville is definitely more friendly, more approachable, casual. It's light. He makes jokes. He's very, very personable, very entertaining. So it was nice to have a balance in that way. This book blends together memoir, nature writing, but then also travel writing. The author starts off the book by discussing his childhood summers that he spent on the Isle of Mull in Scotland with his grandmother, who we learn was a very, very important figure in his life. You can feel her influence all over this book in the best possible way. But he then decides as a grown man in his later life that he wants to follow the Manx Shearwater, a bird that he's always been fascinated by. He wants to follow them from their breeding grounds to where they fly afterward, thousands of miles away. First of all, let me just say, these are incredible creatures. I can see why he's so fascinated by them. You definitely learn a lot about them in this book. It's definitely much more comprehensive than any of the chapters in The Seabird's Cry. He's just focusing on one bird so he can tell you pretty much everything there is to know about them based off of what we know right now. I'm sure we'll know more in the future. But they're just incredible. First of all, this family of birds is called shearwaters because of the way that they fly. They will fly on their side and their bottom wing just slices through the water, hence shearwater, which is actually a super cool name now that I know where it comes from. But they take these incredibly long journeys. I think he said that each individual shearwater will travel millions, like several millions of miles in their lifetime. That's just amazing. And the way that they know where they're going, their navigational abilities, it's different for seabirds than it is for other types of birds. They use their sense of smell. So the basic timeline of this book is that Roger Morgan Grenville initially introduces himself, his love of these birds, and also his connection with his grandmother. Then he makes a choice that he wants to follow them after they leave the breeding grounds. And then he starts his journey, which starts on Skomer Island in Wales, where these birds nest. They actually nest in burrows in the ground that they've dug or that rabbits have dug previously, and they've just kind of taken over. He tags along with a scientific team who are studying these birds, and he tags with his own hands one specific baby. And that's the baby that he kind of thinks of as this process goes along, that it's his Manxi, if you will. So then after that, he travels down to Patagonia in the hopes of seeing not necessarily his Manxi, the one he tagged, but to see them in general. So this book in its entirety is made up of memories from Roger Morgan Grenville's life. He talks about his travel adventures, specifically in South America, of trying to see these birds. And then also it has a lot of scientific information about the Shearwater, like I said before. But sometimes that information takes the form of these really nice, really touching interludes where he more or less tries to put himself into the perspective of that makes Shearwater that he personally tagged. And those sections, of course, include a little bit of anthropomorphism. That's unavoidable. Anytime a human tries to explain the perspective of an animal, there's going to be some of that because we only have our own frame of reference. We can't truly know what it's like for that animal. But that fact being understood, those moments where he's taking the perspective of the bird are my favorite moments in this book. I thought they were so touching and I thought they revealed so much 
about how much Roger Morgan Grenville admires and respects these birds, what they go through, the obstacles they have to overcome, and then eventually the distances that they achieve. But out of all the pieces that made up the book, I think the one I liked the least was the travel writing. I don't think there was enough going on in each of those travel stories to warrant giving so much space over to those sections within the book. Like the way he introduced this journey at the beginning of the book, it was like this huge, I'm going to follow these Manx Shearwaters wherever they go for an entire year. I kind of expected it to be a little bit more than taking a flight down to Argentina and then having struggle after struggle trying to see the birds. But I did really enjoy this book and I do maintain that I loved especially reading it at the exact same time I was reading The Seabirds Cry. Normally in these dual review videos that I do, by the end of the review, I'm either recommending one book over the other. Sometimes I'll recommend that you read one before the other because I think one will inform your reading experience of the other one. This will be the rare occasion where I highly recommend if you're interested in both of these books that you read them at the exact same time. I think it has the potential to enrich your experience in the same way that it did mine. They definitely balance each other out. One's more formal, one's more casual, one's more almost philosophical, the other one's more personal. It's about personal connections to the birds. And yet they do cover very similar ground. I just, I think they are so meant for one another. And if you want to read both and you can handle reading both at the exact same time, I can't recommend it enough. So those are my feelings on these two books on seabirds. If you have read either or both or are interested in either or both, please do let me know in the comment section below. But if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, right in this moment that you're watching this video, you can find me on a variety of different places around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram, the two places I'm the most active. The links to those two profiles, as well as everywhere else you can find me, will be in the description box below. Below. Also in the description box below, there will be a section that I like to call the further reading section, where I will list out some titles that I think you might be interested in if you liked either or both of these books. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video. Bye. <laughs>